that town and country van in Canada for $1,400 cheaper per unit because they have universal health care coverage. Amen. And we let that go away. We're the first country in the history of this world that's just given away their manufacturing base. Okay. Okay. This to the right that we're hearing. And also a lot of the pickup trucks went to Mexico, which is child and slave labor. So when you're, you're not comparing apples to apples, and for people who live through it, the other thing is, you mentioned about the forefathers and the freedoms of this country. Those were the same people that were white slave owners that didn't give women the right to vote, and they had rule of thumb, which means you could beat your wife with anything smaller, a rule that was smaller than your thumb. Is that what you want to go back to? I'm not going to respond to that. That's okay, sir. The other issue is, you said about companies not coming to uh, the state of Missouri. How about Boeing bringing now the wing from the 776? 777X aircraft that are union jobs, machinist jobs. How about Anheuser-Busch, which is now owned by a foreign com country company who has all union workers in their home country, is expanding in the Arnold can plant to produce 16 ounce aluminum cans and hiring more people at Anheuser-Busch. Those are all union jobs. Those UPS trucks you see driving up down the highway, all union jobs. Pepsi, Coke, so in, they're expand, they expanded the GM plant in Wentzville, 1,800 new workers, union jobs. So if we're driving away union jobs, people's jobs, the other issue is I remember when Ronald Reagan became president. He created a lot of jobs. He got rid of $25 an hour jobs and started with minimum wage jobs. So he created a lot of jobs. But we'd like to see those statistics that show how much you are, how much disposable income you're going to have so you can buy that home and live the American dream of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So, and the other thing I'd like to ask, who encouraged you to bring this bill? General, if, if you, you asked me the question, if I remember, but if you, have you grown, have you lived in Southwest Missouri? If you've lived or, or done work or in Southwest Missouri, the culture is very much one that we see, we starkly see the difference in what's happening Having board, having those states around us, we see it. Um, if you represent Southwest Missouri, you're going to sponsor this bill to effectively. I don't believe that because I, I've been. You know, in my chamber of commerce, this this week applauded me for sponsoring this. Bill. Well, sure they did. You're for right see, to work. You're going to see. You're gonna you see, you gave me a wonderful idea community. by saying that because I belong to two chambers of commerce. Now I don't have to pay my yearly dues. I'm going to go in and be a freeloader. Gentlemen, that, Let them cover it. And you know, if they don't, I'm going to go to the federal government and sue them. You know, if you, if so thank you. you don't think they're because I don't think I should have to pay my dues to the Chamber and, of Commerce. You know what, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think that right that you have mm -hmm. is one that I want to give to individual workers. If they're not, if the Chamber isn't representing you effectively, you have that right. Well, if you, like I said, if you've been a union worker, you know yourself. Whenever there's a contract signed, companies are always looking for a way to save money. And it happens every contract. That's why you have work rules. That's why I was able to drive a beer truck till I was 58 years old because I didn't have to hump 175 pound half barrels up three flights of steps. We had work rules that saved on workman's comp cases, saved on our backs and our legs, and able to do the job and support our families. Of course, we had to do our job and not be thieves. One time I was delivering a whole load of Budweiser, me and another guy. As I wait for him to come out, a gentleman comes up. He said, you guys are union, aren't you? And I said, yes. He said, I hate unions. I said, why? He said, because my union wouldn't represent me. And I said, well, the only people our union won't represent are thieves. He turned around and walked away. So with grievance and arbitration machinery, no union is going to represent somebody who is guilty. They say this whole thing about dead wood. That's not true. It's too costly to go through arbitration and lose. So, I have other questions, but I've been monopolized too much, so I'll, I'll back off of that. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much, but I might want to open up for questions later because I hear more of this testimony. Thank you, Representative. Are there others on the committee that have questions? Not appearing. We'll hear from witnesses. Uh, what we're going to do is alternate those in support and those in opposition. Uh, first witness I have in support will be uh, Lieutenant Governor Kinder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, and thanks to you, sir, and to Representative Burleson for doing this important work. Mr. Chairman, every witness opposing this bill should have to uh, place those behind me so I can see them. Should have to answer for these 
facts that were laid before the public, not by me, but by the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Um, this one, March 14th of last year, the young face, G the young face bleak job market. Only 31% of St. Louisans aged 16 to 19 were employed in 2012, down 47% in 2000. How about this one from a few months earlier, September of 2013, huge headline on the front page of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, poverty up, income down. 2010 census data is more bad news for area families. Mr. Chairman, those are not my figures. That, that, that is not my data. That is not anything from ALEC. Those are Obama administration figures from the, from the Obama administration, Department of Commerce, Division of the Census. The census data reported by the president currently in office and those who work for him in his cabinet. This is the reality. About the time this story appeared in September of 2013 in the Post-Dispatch, KMOX Radio reported more grim data. Across I-44 from where thousands of Missourians used to be employed at the Chrysler plants, two of them, until just a few years ago, we have the world's largest mover, United Van Lines. They placed St. Louis number one in outflow of people who were headed south and west because opportunity that existed when many of us were growing up in this state and when St. Louis had four auto plants and was second only to Detroit in auto production, those opportunities are gone and they're not coming back. We all celebrate the recent success with the 777 work coming into Boeing. We all celebrate the the success that we've added jobs recently at Wentzville, GM plant, and the Claycomo Ford plant. Those were special bills passed by the majority of you in the legislature working together in bipartisan fashion to address, to address specific instances faced by those companies. But they do not answer the long-term trends. The 1920s, this, the decade my parents were born into, Missouri had 16 congressional seats. That's how important we were vis-a-vis -vis the other states in the Union. 16 seats. Now, we, we lost them steadily over the decades under current law. The Missouri I grew up in had 10 seats. We had 10 seats in Congress, and we had 12 electoral votes. Still pretty important with two major metro areas. In 1981, we lost a seat because we're not growing as fast. We're barely growing at all. In fact, the numbers for St. Louis, and I keep emphasizing St. Louis because it's 40% of our state's population in the metro area and 50% of our economic activity, and we cannot have a healthy economy in this state without a healthy St. Louis regional economy. And in St. Louis, you had all this work but we were steadily shedding jobs and not growing with population. And since 1970, while metro areas like Atlanta and Charlotte and Dallas and Austin and Houston and San Antonio have just exploded, and many more I could name, St. Louis has grown 1%, 1% population. All we've done is move population around in St. Louis. It's essentially no growth. And so you see young people heading to the Dallases the Atlantas, the Nashvilles, the San Antonios, the Austins, and the rest of these towns for work and opportunity. Now, before the downturn, Mr. Chairman, uh, in 2007, one of our leading bank executives, and I don't know what his position is on right to work because I've never discussed it with him, but he was comparing Nashville with St. Louis. And he told me that in, these are 2007 figures, Nashville, with a population half the size of the St. Louis metro area had more housing starts than St. Louis. Now you can see where opportunity, jobs, investment, and growth are going. They are not, by and large, coming to Missouri. 
And, and those of you who are aware that in the most recent decennial census in 2011, we lost another congressional seat. We were at nine and Tennessee was at nine. They held on to theirs and ours went south. And now we're at eight. What you may not know is that on current trajectory, and we're halfway through this decade, we're on track to lose another seat. So that Missouri, which had 16 seats 80 years ago, or a little over 80 years ago, will have seven after the next census in 2021. The facts are that freedom to work states attract business investments leading to more jobs. In fact, Texas, Texas alone, Texas alone has created more jobs since 2007 than the other 49 states combined. Right to work states have lower unemployment than forced union states. The top five states with the lowest unemployment are right-to-work states. The bottom five in unemployment stats are forced union states. The 10 states with the highest percentage gains in household employment from the recessions in through September of 2012 are all right-to-work states. Conversely, nine of the 12 states with the worst job losses over that same period are not right-to-work states. Another fact, Bureau of Labor Statistics show none of the five states suffering the worst private sector job losses over the past decade has a right to work law. While four of the five states with the greatest gain in private sector jobs have right to work states laws. Now from 2003 to 8, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, jobs in right to work states grew at 9.1 percent. Thank you two and a half times faster than in force union states. Two and a half times faster. The union workers who used to be employed in Detroit, which has shed, what, a million one of its million eight population over the last 50 years, they're in Texas now. They're in Mississippi now. They're in Georgia. They're in North Carolina. Almost 70% of the business executives specify right to work as a key factor important or very important in site selection. Oklahoma, before the two most recent states, this is interesting because here's a neighboring state, before Indiana added right to work, passed it in 2011, and before Michigan followed in December two years ago in 2012, the most recent state to pass right to work was Oklahoma. They passed it in a referendum, a vote of the people. So they did that in 2001. Would you be interested to know, Mr. Chairman, that Oklahoma added more union jobs last year than we did here in, in, in Force Union, Missouri? If there is nothing in the proposed bill before you that prevents union membership, if a union can sell itself to its members, good for them. Good for them. If they, if they can demonstrate that they add value, I applaud them. And the facts are, not the emotional rhetoric from coal mines of 80 years ago, and there were great abuses to be corrected then, but that's not the America we're talking about today. No one disputes that the trade union movement has been a good thing for America, or that it has no place. No one is saying that. Now, we know that average compensation, we get cited to well, compensation's higher in forced union states. I guarantee you it's got to be higher in New York where a tiny little, what we would call a tiny little apartment can cost you $3,000 a month versus what you could get for that money in Missouri or Oklahoma or Kansas. When you adjust for the cost of living, there's more money in the worker's pocket in a right to work state. Since 2007, all of Missouri's bordering right to work states. Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Tennessee have enjoyed a higher percentage increase in personal income than has Missouri. No one is putting a gun to the head of the people who are leaving the St. Louis metro area or Detroit for, for the last 60 years until they passed right to work two years ago. They're leaving for opportunity and jobs in, in states that are a long way from where they grew up. Now, these are the facts, and, and Representative Burleson cited them very well. 
but I want to wrap up by saying this is not merely about economics. There is a moral issue at stake here. Why do the opponents of this bill want to force Missourians in, into unions just to keep their jobs? Why do they insist that, they be, that workers be forced to bankroll political activities they do not support? The majority party would not have the members in this legislature that you do if, if a lot of union members had not voted for you. And you can go district by district and we can prove that, whether it's Jefferson County or St. Charles County or many other places across this state. Now, we're, we're told by the opponents of this bill that this is a union busting bill. Of course, right to work does nothing of the kind it simply prevents unions from compelling member, uh, membership as a condition of employment. Now, you have heard the motives of, of supporters of this bill attacked, and you will hear it all afternoon from opponents. But I've got a question for you. What other than naked self-interest motivates the opponents of right to work? When workers actually have a choice, union membership falls, in many cases dramatically. That saves workers and costs unions a lot of money. So we see who's got naked self-interest at work here. However, as the example and the facts of Oklahoma show us, if a union truly provides quality service and responds to its members' needs, it need not work. It need not worry about its members bailing out when they're finally given the freedom to choose. And that's what happened in Oklahoma. You can talk to business executives Mr. Chairman, from the St. Louis construction uh, uh, folks, and ask them, how's work? And they say, it's been an awful, awful, terrible, rough six, seven years. And you know what they've been doing? If there isn't a big hospital job or a casino, and thank goodness we're not building any more of those, apparently, there isn't much work and they're looking to Dallas. They're opening an office in Dallas or an engineering firm that, that never thought of going there before now has a, an office in Austin because there's work down there. When you, when you go interview a friend of mine in, in Springfield, Tom Sutherland, of the lumber company, the building materials uh, folks, Sutherland on the south and west part of the state, He'll tell you it's been years since even, he's even thought about opening a Sutherland's in Missouri. I said, where are you looking to open? Oh, he said, Oklahoma, Kansas, Arkansas. That's where it's going, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't want to live. I don't want to live in a Missouri that loses another congressional seat. That we go down to seven seats and we're that insignificant vis-a-vis in, uh, -vis the rest of the country. And only nine electoral votes. That's where we're headed now. That's where we are now. Poverty up, income down. The young face a bleak job market. That's why the young people are, are going to the Nashvilles and the Austins and the Dallases and the Atlantas. They're going south and west, says United Van Lines, which is in the business of knowing where people are moving to and where they're moving from. Those are the facts. You have a chance in this bill no such bill has ever been voted on on the floor of the Missouri House or Senate. You've reported it out of committee, but you've never taken a vote on the floor of either the House or Senate. I'm asking you to do that and to make history this year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Governor. Representative Burns. Uh, permission to inquire. Please be mindful of the hour. We've got a lot of witnesses. Um, Respectfully, Lieutenant Governor, um, I think you're mixing apples and oranges. You said 80 years ago unions made a big difference. Today they don't, basically what you said. There was a thing back there in those years and before called the Iron Belt. And when these, a lot of folks moved up from Mississippi and Tennessee, and, and that's why uh, Chicago came, became one of the blues capitals of the world. A lot of those folks were gospel, they're singers, and it's the Iron Belt. Again, back to my other quite, my other statement, we're the first country in the history of the world has given away our manufacturing base. So those jobs are non-existent anymore. And quite frankly, the reason that these companies are 
locating them in these states that are right to work because they complain pay less dollars. So the other thing you said about this one right here, that it's bleak, there's a whole lot of other factors tied into that, like our, our total desertion of public education. So in the inner city, what, what is a young person supposed to do? They're too young to go to work at McDonald's. People wonder why there's a murder rate that's so high. They can't go to work at McDonald's. School is failing them because they're out of funds. And so some guy comes at them on the street corner and says, here, sell these drugs for me, and you can make five or $600 a day. What way do we expect that young person to go? So then somebody comes on their street corner in their neighborhood, and, they, and one shoots the other one. That's where these murders are coming from. It has nothing to do with a black-white crime. The same thing existed back in the 30s under prohibition. It's called a poor crime. So the statistics, and again, I'm trying to be totally respectful because I do respect you very much. Both of these things are so wrong. We used to have 100,000 sewing machines on Washington Avenue in St. Louis between 12th Street and 18th Street. Those jobs are in China. I get, do we expect people to move to China to get those jobs? Representative Bamford. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. I'm respectful of you as well. And I honor your service and your work all those years. Uh, and your work here. Uh, I'm reminded of the uh, debate that took place when this state had a referendum on right to work. It was 1978. I don't know if you remember. I worked hard. I was, I was, I was in college. Hard. And you helped defeat it. I helped defeat it. Was, it was 60 years ago. You know, the, uh, I, I mean, uh, it was 1978, so it was, what, 30, uh, seven years ago. So I was in college. So here's the deal. You know what? The Missouri I grew up in was number two to uh, St. Louis and autos, but we were also, the old saying was, St. Louis was first in shoes and first in booze and last in the American League, okay? All the big shoe companies were headquartered in St. Louis, right? Interco, in Brown Shoe Company, and every little town in southeast Missouri, I don't know how far west this went, but I know it went to central Missouri, every little town had a shoe factory. All over the state. 300 jobs here, 450 jobs there, and they were a mainstay of the local economy. You know what the arguments of folks like you on your side of that referendum said? If you pass right to work, we're going to lose these shoe jobs. Well, nobody, we defeated nobody right to work, and certain inexorable, inevitable, unavoidable economic forces made, made it such that all of those shoe jobs have left in my adult lifetime. And the economy was in transition. Uh, they went to China, which today has 80% of the world's shoes. You know what's happening to China? They're losing the same production to Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and Pakistan. This, these are forces that no one can stop. We, we adopted your view in 1978 with, with these, these shoe factory folks Work, voting against right to work because they were going to lose their jobs, and they lost their jobs anyway. Same with the garment industry you just referred to and the hat factories on Washington Avenue. They are overseas now. No one could have prevented that. That has proceeded through Democrat administrations, Republican administration. Those were undeniable inexorable forces like the tides. And we've got to educate our workforce, and I'm in hearty agreement with you about the failure of the inner city schools. I hope you'll join me in, the, in the, my 20-year battle to pass school choice so that parents have more than one, uh, never, never. one size fits all. That's, going to that's not our more. discussion. Never never here. Destroy it more. Okay, and the other issue is, sir, uh, just to respond, and again respectfully, uh, nobody foresaw NAFTA or these free trade agreements. Even Ross Perot, who wasn't in either of our parties, said you're going to see a giant sucking sound. So, like, you mean the NAFTA that was passed by Bill Clinton? By Bill Clinton. And, or, the, or the state here, you say, have been losing jobs that's been under your party's administration Bill since 2000. But we've been under your party's administration as governor since year 2000. Uh, so, wait, wait, wait. Let's review the facts there. My party has won one election for governor since 1992. That was 2004. We've had sorry, four years for it. Out of and the legislature, though, has been under your control. Well, since 2002. I'd have to check that statistic. Okay, but it point, the point being is, there's an old saying. I heard this when I first got became a union member out of high school. 
and I've been, and I, and I enjoy. I'm still working today. I graduated from high school on uh, Friday night in June 1966, and I've been working ever since. And I'm happy to be able to work and pay taxes. But there's an old saying: Union people worked hard for the American dream, gave their children a better life than what they had, sent their children to college, and the co children went to college and learned how to bust unions. Again, union is the last bastion of independence for our workers. The reason those jobs are going to other states is far beyond, I can go there and make more money. They've got to choke down so much, particularly in rural areas, like you just said. Drive around anywhere in the state, which, you know, when I work for the for federal officials, I've been all over the state. All of these places are, are just in dismal, dismal poverty. Well, when we left Cape Girardeau to go to Naranda on our freshman tour, it looked like you pulled in a black and white movie. It's so economically depressed. Well, Senator, uh, Representative, that is not a recent development. Well, but the, the issue Blue is... Hill counties have always been poor. But I'm saying, but that's true. But the point is, why would they try to pass something that's only given the one person to be able to negotiate or talk to an employer doesn't work. I mean, even doctors are in an association with the same thing as a union. Teachers, there's no way that you can negotiate because what happens is, sure, they will play a favorite and you're going to get taken care of or they want to organize and they'll put a basket of groceries by the time clock and say this is what a month's union does. But no union in these days and times are in business because they have self-interest. The other thing, I'd just like to correct you on something. Representative, what, I have one thing, two more witnesses. All right, one thing you, you said, one thing you said, Governor, that, you. your, that your, your dues money goes to uh, candidates. That's not true. That's a separate fund that you have to voluntarily sign up to do. So you can't, your union dues do not go to back political candidates. We'll, Thank you, Mr. We'll Mayor. agree to disagree on that one. Well, Thank you like very to much. Like to see you appreciate it. Gentlemen, I have 22 more witnesses. We need to move on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Senator Green and Marion Hayes, please. Thank you, member, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Tim Green. And with me is Marion Hayes, uh, president of BRK Electric in St. Louis County. I'm here testifying on behalf of the St. Louis Chapter National Electrical Contractors Association, who represent 226 contractors and electrical and communication contractors in the eastern half of Missouri. These contractors employ over 4,000 electricians and communication technicians. NECA holds the collective bargaining rights for the contractors we represent and negotiate labor agreements for these companies with various major construction unions. I am here to testify on behalf of these Missouri contractors to express our strong opposition to right to work legislation in Missouri. Right to work is an unnecessary and unwanted governmental intrusion which would limit the rights of unionized Missouri employers and negatively impact our ability to compete. The association that I am speaking for have represented Missouri contractors in collective bargaining for decades. Several have bargained union contracts for more than 100 years. We have negotiated union security clauses in our labor agreements that require employers to become union members. Right to work legislation would make these union security clauses illegal. Our contractors freely accept these union security requirements by choice as part of the agreements that define the conditions beneficial to both our employers and our employees. Employers with union agreements are only required under current law to bargain in good faith with a union representing their employees concerning union security issues. Make note of this statement. No Missouri employer is obligated are forced to accept union security provisions as part of a labor agreement. Employers must accept these terms voluntarily and often we do so for mutual benefit. The U.S. Supreme Court has decided that an employee under the union security clause is obligated only to pay union dues for the employee's proportional share of represent, representation activities of the union. Contar contrary to popular misconceptions, no employee who objects can be forced to pay for our political activities of the union unrelated to the terms of the labor agreement. 
Most union construction contractors are union contractors by choice. These employers voluntarily bound their companies to labor agreements for sound business reasons. Some of these reasons are a union agreement provides an employer with access to the best trained and professionally, uh, professionally trained construction employees. Union contractors realize that our labor agreements create a pool of qualified labor that allows the company to secure highly skilled workers. Most union construction contractors are proud of the relationship they have with the union. Our joint apprenticeship and training program for just our 220 contractors and our 4,000 employees spends close to $10 million a year in apprenticeship training at no cost to the taxpayer. These union contractors and their employees spend close to 45 to $50 million annually in health care benefits. Our workers have health insurance for the families and pensions when they retire. There is probably one of the reasons there's a migration out of the state of Missouri is because some of our employees can retire with dignity and they move to Florida out of the cold weather. Employer signatory to union agreements can also provide our customers with drug-free workforce cost-effective pool substance abuse programs. Our pensions in the St. Louis community over the last 10 years, not just the electricians, but all the construction trades, have invested $1.2 billion in investment into businesses in the St. Louis metropolitan community. It may be a surprise proponents of right to work, but union contractors from Missouri did work competitively across the country. And in closing, I'd just like to touch upon a few things before Marion talks about it. <clears throat> But they had said, the sponsor, that right to work is one of the scenarios businesses look for. Right to work is not even in the top 10 if you look at any economic development periodicals. The top four are education, electric rates, and I think with the issue of Naranda and Amron UE that's been going around for the last seven years, we can all attest to that, infrastructure, Businesses want to be able to distribute their projects. And the biggest one of all, incentives. Over the last three years, Missouri has passed economic development bills twice that have brought industry into this state. In 2011, you passed the car manufacturing plant uh, tax incentives. You had the expansion of Ford and Clay Como and GM in Wentzville. The legislature in December of 2013 passed incentives in for aircraft manufacturing. You have seen an expansion with those incentives. Four years ago, data centers came to Missouri and asked for some tax incentives. We did not give those because there was a big debate on creating more tax incentives. Well, that growth went to Omaha, Nebraska where currently 200 electricians of these 4,000 are currently living and working from the St. Louis community to find work. So we can all sit here and continue to debate, but it's education, electric cost, infrastructure, and incentives. Mary? Well, thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. Uh, again, my name is Marion Hayes. Uh, I am the owner, uh, CEO of BRK Electrical Contractors. Uh, briefly on my background, so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, obviously, everyone knows where Ferguson is. Well, I grew up near that area, and uh, actually, Tim was my representative for a while in the north. Yes, yeah, and, and, and in the north county, in the north county uh, area. Um, graduate Hayes with East High School. Also, a graduate of Washington University with a bachelor's of in electrical engineering as well as a master's in construction management. In addition to that, after I got my bachelor's, I went into, after decided what I wanted to do, went into the, as an electrical apprentice, an IBW local union number one, and I am also a journeyman electrician and worked as a project manager for a number of years before I decided to start my own business. So I think I'm well versed on many different sides of the fence to be able to at least speak honestly on how I feel about this. And as far as for our association, this is something that I, as well as my other fellow um, 
fellow electrical contractors have done by choice for well over a hundred years. Uh, our association with the IBWB, signatory with them, uh, does provide us with a very strong qualified workforce. I mean, electricity is nothing to play with, obviously. Uh, people get hurt with it all the time, trying to wire, wire this or wire that. And so when I hire someone, I need to know that they know what they're doing. Um, that's being able to know that gentlemen have gone through the apprenticeship program and are trained and then have another additional uh, thousands of hours of training because now it's 10,000 hours instead of 8,000 is very valuable uh, to me because obviously we have many different regulations we have to hold to and that is a real plus. Um, in addition, I did want to say a couple of other things. Um, in addition to bringing us qualified workforce. Um, the, with the Associated Union, we have a clear employee relations uh, structure. I think that's very important. When you're starting off small, grabbing and getting all that stuff together is pretty tough. Um, you get that when you, when you are associated with the union as well as the access to the workforce. That was very important as we started work right off the bat with Ameren. Can't, you know, I don't know how long it took me to hire 11 guys that knew what they were doing so I could give them direction and they can go execute the job. Very important. Uh, union's been supportive of our efforts. Uh, speaking slightly on uh, diversity, we were the prime electrical contractor on the, I guess it's now called the Stan Mutual Veterans Memorial Bridge. When we did it, it was the new I-70 Mississippi River Bridge at the time. Uh, we were. We prevented, uh, presented an idea that MoDOT got an award where they saved over a million dollars for our redesign. Um, that work was all done by uh, union labor. Uh, in addition to that, I would like to say that um, even though the requirement was only 14%, I believe, diversity by MoDOT and the Department of Labor, that, you know, as far as on the electrical trade concern, 50% of that workforce was done by more minority and 7% by women. Um, in addition, my lead foreman was also an African American. I think that's uh, very important to know that as an African American male, as an African American male who still lives in North County, and what happened this summer, I think those are very important stories and things that need to be brought out to you as legislatures in terms of the benefits that union that are representing African American workers paying a middle class wage. Uh, the one thing of note that I keep hearing about, well, all these jobs are going here and the businesses are going there, but the wages there are lower in some of these states. And the one thing I always find interesting, I, I know this, capitalism is always going to find the lowest cost possible. You learn that in school, you read it in the paper. I understand as a businessman, I'm trying to maximize my profit as much as possible. The other thing, though, that the paradigm of that is businesses also need consumers. So you got to have the people. You got to have people with jobs. You got to, and then you also need people to have jobs with the disposable income so that they can buy the products, goods, and services. The debate that I always have with my wife all the time. Well, gee.